Okay, hi, hello everyone, I'm Michalis Kamburelis and welcome to the latest Castle Game Engine tutorial. So, we are a general purpose 3D and 2D game engine. We have a few important features, we list them on our website, I'm going to also showcase them during this tutorial. Basically, we feature a powerful visual editor where you can design your games. We also support open formats like GLTF and X3D. And finally, we're using both for the development of the engine and also for the development of your games, the modern object-oriented Pascal, which allows very fast execution and also very like clean and safe code of your games. So let's jump in. So the first thing you want to do is you want to of course visit our website and download the engine for your system, like this, that's it. And um, the second thing you also want to download while that this is going, you also want to download the compiler for the Pascal language and probably also download some IDE, which is like integrated development environment for it. So follow the link how to install the Castle Game Engine and there you will find the link to the Lazarus website and basically you want to go there and you want to click download now. And this will download the Lazarus and Free Pascal compiler for your system. You want to install it. You want to install Lazarus and Free Pascal compiler. Now, once you have it, so Free Pascal compiler, Lazarus, and then also Castle Game Engine, go ahead and execute it. So let me just interrupt it because I have already downloaded it previously. So you're going to have an archive like this. You want to unpack it and inside the archive you're going to find the binary for Castle Editor and you want to run it. This is our main tool. From this tool you will execute, you will design your games and execute and build them and yeah, pretty much execute every other useful operation on your project that uh, we have implemented. Okay. So I'm going to execute it just in a little bit different way because I have the development version and it looks like this. Uh, so, the first thing you probably want to do is you want to go to the new project and create a new project. And uh, once you get a bit more familiar with the engine, you will probably start most of new projects from the empty templates, from which you can kind of build your user interface and your viewports in however way you would like to. For this demo uh, and for the beginning when you start to learn the engine, I would recommend that you try the 3D FPS game and also the 2D game templates and see how the 3D and 2D games are supposed to kind of being designed using the engine. So let's try it out. Let's create a new project, 3D FPS game. Okay. And once it opens, let's take a look basically what's inside. So you have really two important directories here. Code, this is the Pascal code that we are going to edit in a second. And you have the data, which is what is going to be packaged with your games. It should contain, well, basically everything that you may want to load at runtime, in particular the designs, the 3D models, the images, and so on. Uh, let's go ahead and actually open some design of your game. We have two designs in this 3D FPS game template. One is the main menu. This is a bit just two buttons and that's it. The other, much more interesting, is the design of the 3D world of your game. So this is called GameStatePlay.Castle user interface. And as you can see, I have opened it by just double clicking. You can also go design open this way. So once it opens, you see the hierarchy of items on the left. You can add and remove here stuff. Uh, in the middle, you have the well design area where you kind of preview what's going on inside your game. On the right hand side you have something called Object Inspector which displays the properties of basically the currently selected item and you can adjust them all as you wish. And on the bottom you see the file list of your project. The fields inside your project well, they are just regular files so you can just choose open containing folder and view the same files using your field explorer and yeah it just works um, so let's go ahead and do some basic editing what can you do here so first of all when you click with the right mouse button you activate something called mouse look which means that now when i'm dragging the mouse i'm rotating the view using the keys a w s d i can move around in my level and using the mouse scroll i can make mouse movement go faster or slower. I can also use the Q and E keys to go higher and lower. 
And this is your basic way to kind of navigate in 3D and, uh, well, do whatever you want. Look at whatever you want inside your modern, your, your level. You can select anything that you would like to and you can press the F key, like focus, to kind of select the thing that you have uh, to, to, to bring into focus, to view exactly the thing that you have selected, like this. And you can also always press the home key to kind of view everything you have here. Uh, more keys, more useful shortcuts, how to navigate in the viewport are of course available in the viewport menu. In particular, we also have some 7, 1, 3 and similar keys that allow you to easily switch to the top and side views of the, end of the, of the level that you're looking at. So these are deliberately like consistent with Blender and Godot Engine too. Uh, so, what can you do here? Well, you can look around, you can also move stuff. So, the viewport is the area that shows you the three-dimensional stuff that is part of your game. You can select things inside your viewport. To do this, uh, you have to switch to the selection, to the selecting transformation or moving transformation mode, for example. Let me switch to the moving transformation mode. And now I can select particular scenes. And once I select them, I can of course move them wherever I would like to. So this is like your basic way to move stuff around in the three-dimensional world. The camera and the lights are also just regular objects that you can just select and move however you like. So, for example, this is a directional light and I can just, well, move it. Moving it doesn't actually change anything because it's a directional light, but I can also rotate it, okay? So, it's just a regular 3D object. You can move the light just like anything else. And finally, we have also the cameras. Once you select the camera, you will see a preview of the camera visible in the bottom right corner. And now you can kind, you can also even pin it so that it stays selected no matter, no matter what else you do in the scene. And now you can move the camera and you can observe what happens when I move the camera. So I'm moving the camera using the gizmo on, our, on my larger view and the camera preview is updated accordingly. So this is one way to move the camera and to adjust what the camera sees in your scene which is what, in the end, the user will see when the user will run your game. Okay, so let's actually run the game. Mm, let me just first uh, disable the soundtrack by double-clicking on XML field that defines sounds and basically disable the soundtrack because it will be too loud. Okay. Uh, so what I did now is I pressed F9 to invoke the compile and run mini command and as you can see it's going. Uh, the first compilation of the project will take um, a few, I think like, well, not long, but a few seconds. Uh, the subsequent compilations of the project will be just lighting fast because well, the Pascal compiler will only recompile what has changed. Okay. Okay, and there you have it. So, the game is running. At the beginning, it displays the game state main, which shows us the main menu. Once we click play, once we click play, it switches to the state play, which we have just designed. And I can now move around. Now I'm just playing the game like a normal user. This is a normal executable running on my computer. And I can move around because the walk navigation is set up by default in this template. I can even shoot those people, those uh, simple enemies. And as you can see, one of the enemies is walking in the air because that's where we have like dragged him up a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago. Um, so I can like play my game, I can see that it works, I can see the frames per second and I can use the mouse look if I press the control M, I can use it like a normal person. Okay, so what more can we do? Well, of course, we can mm, add more scenes to our view. So, for example, if I have a soldier here, I can duplicate the soldiers. I can duplicate using the Control D uh, shortcut. All the shortcuts are, of course, listed in the Edit menu. So, let me press Control D like this. And now I have another. Let's make another and another and another 
and it works okay so i can create many scenes this way i could also just if i want to use a new model into my game i would just like basically just drop uh, another gltf or xvd file into my data and load it and i could display it and we are actually going to do it in well, like 10 minutes we are going to design a simple missile uh, to be displayed in our game so i can add new scenes i can also move around and design user interface in this view uh, because what you have seen here well the viewport is just one thing where you can place the 2d or 3d stuff the viewport has a camera navigation and so on but the viewport is not everything in your scene there is also user interface which is just which are just like 2d elements which are kind of glued to the screen in this simple example at the beginning we just have two things we have uh, text that displays frames per second and text that displays some information but of course we can add more for example let's add some button and now i have some button let me switch to the user interface manipulation i can for example make this button much larger i can change the caption Caption of a button like this. I can disable the auto sizing of the button and now I can actually drag it to have any size I would like to. So this way I can design my user interface. Oh, I can also anchor it. So we have anchors that allow you to make UI element basically stick to a particular edge or the center of the screen. And you can, of course, adjust anchors this way. For example, we can make the button centered on the screen. And now whatever I will do with the window, this works both at design time and at runtime, where this button will like stubbornly stay at the center of the screen. Let me actually move it to the bottom because it's going to be a problem later. Um, okay, so you can design user interface this way. And uh, I think that's actually the basic show of the capabilities of the editor, what you can do in the editor with your three-dimensional world and with your user interface. Now, before we jump into some code exercises, let's first explore, let's first explore also the two-dimensional game template, okay? So let me just save it, close and switch to another project, and create a new project that starts from the two-dimensional game template. It looks very similar, Except the game state play, by default, it contains, well, different things. Different things that show an example layout of a two-dimensional game. By default, we start here with, in a two-dimensional navigation mode, at design time, which means that if I press with the right mouse button and drag, the screen like drags like this, so I cannot navigate by default. I cannot navigate here in like a three-dimensional fashion. Instead, I can just move around, shift left, right, and top uh, and up, down my view. I can also, of course, use the mouse scroll to um, zoom in, zoom out. Uh, what more? Well, just like in the three-dimensional case, we have a camera. You can actually already see the preview of the camera here. If I click on the camera like this, it of course shows me what is the camera actually seeing. And again, I can basically do similar things that I could do in 3D. So for example, I can move the camera and observe what happens when I move the camera uh, in the preview of the camera. I can of course move everything else. So for example, I can move this dragon, I can move it here, I can move some sprite sheets here and there. I can duplicate those sprite sheets. So if I'd like to, I can have more of those tentacles on the level. Okay, and of course I can run the game. So let's do it. Okay, I'm used to doing it by the key shortcut, but I emphasize this is available from the menu. If you go to the run, compile and run, you can just do it by clicking. Okay, and just in the previous case, well, the first compilation of each project takes a bit time because it actually compiles the project, uh, in, including the engine but the subsequent compilation will be lighting fast. Okay. Let's switch to that. And as you can see, it displays the view that we have designed with the lots of tentacles, with the camera view that we have set up. 
And the sample code of this game, uh, the, the code of this game already contains some simple instructions to actually react to clicking on your scene. And when you click, the dragon is moving to the place that we have indicated, and the viewport, where the camera of the viewport actually shifts to kind of follow the dragon. You can actually disable it, so then you can fly with your dragon like this. Both modes, of course, make sense. Okay. Uh, so that's actually the basic things that you can do inside Castle Game Engine Editor. Obviously, you can do here everything that you could have done also in the three-dimensional version. In particular, you can add some user interface elements, okay, like this. Oh, and remember also that the viewport is actually, in case of in Castle Game Engine, the viewport is also a user interface element. So what you can actually do is you can toggle the full size checkbox from true default to false and now you can see that the viewport that you have been operating all through this time well it's actually a user interface you can move it around on your on your screen you can anchor it however you like uh, yeah you can resize it however you like to but the viewport is a regular user interface control that is like a window well, a viewport to your 2D or 3-dimensional game world. Oh, and you can also have multiple viewports in Castle Game Engine, by the way. For example, you have, I can duplicate the viewport just like another user interface control. So I just press the Control D and now I have two viewports. This works. So I can have multiple viewports. If you'd like to learn, you can also synchronize actually both those viewports to show you from different camera angles the same world with the same things happening inside. The information how to do it is inside our manual. Basically, you just assign the items from one viewport to another. So, just emphasizing, the viewport is just a regular user interface control in Castle Game Engine. So let's take a look at some specifics of the two-dimensional project in this case. So the two-dimensional project is using actually scenes, mm, it's using animations designed in two ways. The dragon is, has been designed using spine, and this means that it's a smooth animation. You can, if you double-click on it, it will run the view 3D scene, which is our model browser in the engine. And as you can see, the dragon has a number of animations, like attack, dying, flying, and idle. And those are all smooth animations, they just animate using a skeleton, okay? So this is a spine animation, if you like to use spine to design your 2D animations. Another approach to design 2D animations is using sprite sheets. And in SolidWorks inside Castle Game Engine, we have actually our own Castle sprite sheet format, which is very much done on top uh, of the Starling uh, sprite sheet format. And you can double click on a Castle sprite sheet to actually take a look at how is the sprite sheet constructed, to add new animations to it, and uh, yeah, you can kind of design your own sprite sheet from your texture. For example, this is a tentacle that contains two animations, spawn and idle. Okay, and so let's actually try and create a new sprite sheet from an existing texture atlas. So let's create a new sprite sheet. Let's import here an atlas. We should have here some sample textures. Mm. For example, let's choose this one, okay? So this looks like a texture atlas that contains five columns and four rows of frames, okay? So let's go ahead and import it, uh, making sure to specify the correct number of columns and correct number of rows this way, okay? And we can preview animation this way. As you can see, it looks like it's both idle and die animation. We will want to split those frames into two animations. You can also preview them frame by frame. So now when I click on a particular animation, I can just browse the particular frame that I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, okay, so the way to create a new animation. So first of all, let's actually delete some empty images that have been unused basically frames, empty frames in the texture atlas. Now let's move some of the remaining animations, uh, some of the frames to another animation. So I'm going to select them with control okay, and I'm going to right click and say 
a create new animation from selection. And it works like this. Now let's preview it. Okay, this looks like a nice die animation. So let's call it like this. And from here, let's actually remove those frames and leave only the initial frames such that what you have looks like idle. Okay, so now it looks like an idle animation. All right, let's save it. So we have now a sprite sheet with two animations idle and die. Okay, let's save it. Mm, is it a goblin? I think it's a goblin. Okay, and it has created a file called goblin.castle sprite sheet. And now let's clean up those viewports. Okay, and let's add our sprite sheet to our hierarchy. So I can create a new scene like this. And in the scene, I can assign a URL pointing to the newly created castle sprite sheet. So I'm just going to do this, this, and choose the goblet.sprite sheet. All right. Oh, sorry. Okay. And it has created the goblin, but I do suspect it's, uh, it's very small. Okay. So it's right here. Oh, and it's also behind the background. Okay. So that's good. So let's see how to make it properly. Okay. So let's set the Z, which determines like the front and back order to something large like this. Let's also sort them to make sure that this is displayed correctly. Okay. And yes, it's visible. It's just very, very small. So let's scale it up. 10 times. Uh, I think 10 is actually good, but for the purpose of this presentation, let's make it huge, okay? No, no that's, that's too huge, okay? <laughs> let's make it 20. Uh, let's actually move it such that it will be visible in the camera view, okay? So, we have added a new scene with a new castle sprite sheet into our two-dimensional game. Uh, to run the animation, both at design time and runtime, the easiest way is to just set the auto animation property. And here you can select your animation. It automatically picks up the animations that you have designed using the spreadsheet editor. So if I choose idle like this, it will just work, okay? Now, another thing that you may wonder if you're designing a 2D game, well, this is obviously something that was supposed to look like a pixel art. And by default, the engine is using the billionaire filtering, which basically means that it's smoothing out the pixels, the color of the pixels. So you probably want it to look a bit different, such that pixels, when they are scaled up, actually still look like pixels, okay? So to do this, you select the render options inside your scene and you modify something called magnification filter and minification filter. If you set them both to nearest, it's, um, it will already, uh, one of them works when you are zoomed in, one of them works when you are zoomed out. If you set them, as you can see, we have switched like the sprite should look to be like a pixel art. So when I get close, I can see big, big pixels on my screen. And so that's how you would design a sprite sheet in a two-dimensional game. Okay. So that's actually what I wanted to show for the two-dimensional game demo. Um, let's now switch back to the three-dimensional game demo and do there a bit of code editing, okay? So let's switch back to this, to this. No. Okay. Uh, so, what more can I do here? Well, I already kind of told that you can, of course, create new scenes here. Of course, you can also create new lights here. For example, let me add a new light, a spotlight. Okay. And let's make it shine on the scene. To make it, like, super visible, I will just do like this, okay? So I will just set the intensity of the light to something more, okay? So I can, of course, design lights in Castle Game Engine Editor this way, okay? And now let's see how to create something from code. So there are actually two tasks that I want to do from code. One, when I click on the button, I want the button to actually play some sound, okay? 
So to do this, let's first rename the button, button playing sound, because I want to access the button now from code. And the second thing I want to do while I'm still in the editor, I want to actually add an asset, let's call it, a component that represents the sound that is going to be played. How to do this? Well, I do have actually a sound prepare on my desktop. It should sound like this. So it's a werewolf. So it's a werewolf howling, okay? So I want to take this audio file and copy it into the data files of my game. How to do it in the easiest way? Well, I click, right click, open containing folder, and I just copy the file. It's just the directory with files, okay? And now the field werewolf howling has appeared in my project. I can actually kind of preview it in the editor. If I click on something in the editor, it shows me the preview. In case of images, it's going to be an image. In case of three-dimensional object, it's going to be, well, the actual three-dimensional object, of course. In case of sound fields, it actually allows me to play the sound from within the editor. Right? So I can also test that the sounds are kind of played correctly by the engine this way. Okay, so we have placed the audio file inside the data of my project. Now let's add to the design actually the sound component that will allow me to play this sound. To do this I'm adding a non-visual component called sound. I'm assigning the URL to point to the sound field that I have placed. Uh, it's right here, okay? And that's it. So sound, let's call it sound werewolf, okay? So I have now two things. I have button playing sound and I have the sound and I want to use to edit my source code to actually connect them. When you click on a button, the sound should start playing, okay? So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, I want to edit the game state play for this. In most of your work with custom game engine, you will actually edit some state code. This is like your main entry point to interact basically with the user to react to the user pressing something, doing something, okay? So how to do this? Well, I can just double click on the file and because I have instant Lazarus on my system, it automatically opens the game state plate unit and I can edit it. Okay, so what can I do here? Well, first of all, I want to access the button state playing sound from code. So the easiest way to do it is to press F2, Ctrl C and copy the button playing sound into the keyboard, into the clipboard, so. And now I want to define the component to actually access it so that it's loaded, it's the reference to the button is available when the state is actually starts working, okay? So now I have the button playing sound available. Now I want to assign an onClick event to it, okay? So to do this I write button playing sound dom dot on click and let's say play sound click. In the free pass type parallel I want to write this upper sound. If you use Delphi you actually don't want this so if you want to be compatible with both compiler you may even want to write it like this. Okay so now I'm going to press shift ctrl c to allow Lazarus to automatically complete the code and generate the code empty at the beginning. Empty code of the play sound click method form. Okay all right, what can I do here? Well, I want to play sound, but actually let's first do something much simpler, which is display a log. Okay, the button has been clicked. Let's display the log that actually confirms that uh, we have correctly captured clicking on the button. Okay, well now let's recompile the game. Uh, let's save it. Okay, let's play it. And now each time I'm pressing on this weird button that I have added at the bottom, each time I do it, the lock button click is actually generated. Okay, cool. So we can handle clicking on a button. Now let's play some sound, okay? So to play some sound, well, I need to access the sound werewolf component from code. So let's define this. Right. 
I'm doing some copy pasting basically to make it faster. Okay, so now my code has a knowledge that keeps a reference to the sound wherewith component. And now when somebody clicks on a button, well, I want to actually use it. How to use it? Well, you use, you use the sound engine, global um, singleton, and singleton that allows you to play sounds using the Castle Game Engine. You call the play method and you pass there your sound component instance. And that's it. It will work except let's move the Castle Sound Engine definition higher because this actually defines the Castle Sound class. And that's it. Let's run the game. Each time I click the button, the werewolf sound is playing. And also we still generate the lock. Because why not? Okay. Uh, okay, now let's do something a bit more complicated, which is let's add a new scene to our design. Okay, so let's actually do two things. One is uh, we are going to create two models in Blender. One is going to be some simple silly thing that we will be able to place on our level just to show that we can add additional things to the three-dimensional level. And the other thing will be the missile. The missile that we will shoot from the player position and it will move along the direction where the player is looking. Okay, so let's first made, first made a simple thing that we can place on a level. So I have run Blender. Uh, let's do um, let's do a simple like a sculpture of a monkey, okay? That we will be able to place around the level because for some reason this level is filled with uh, sculptures of monkeys, statues of monkeys, okay? So let's do it. Why not? Uh, first of all, we don't really need the camera and lighting that the blender is by default proposing us. Let's add to the blender a simple monkey, okay? That's easy enough. Let's actually make it smooth by using like this once, like this once. Okay, this looks good, looks good for the demo. Okay, let's have a cylinder here. Let's move it a bit like this, scale it easy, like this. Okay, does this look like a statue of a monkey? I guess for the purpose of this demo, Good enough. Let's move it a bit up so it kind of stands like on the ground. Oh, let's also add some colors to it, okay? So let's create a new material. Let's make it a yellowish kind of from Blender. Okay, let's preview that it's okay. Let's assign here the same material. The same material. So everything is a yellow. Yellow, okay. This is actually the good preview of the material when the lights are off. Uh, okay, so that's our yellow statue of a monkey that for some reason we are going to put in our three-dimensional level, okay? Let's save it. Let's save it first to a Blender file so that we don't lose it. So let's call it monkey.blend. Ah, extension is automatic. Okay, and now to actually use it in Castle Game Engine, you want to export it in because the Castle Game Engine cannot directly read the .blend file. So you want to export it to the GLTF file. Okay, like this. And the default GLTF export options are actually okay, so you can just click export GLTF. But I actually recommend for but for this model it doesn't matter. But for most models I would recommend you to choose the GLTF separate option. Why? Because then the textures are not embedded inside the GLTF file. Which is actually better, because it allows you to have multiple GLTF models using the same texture files. Which is just more optimal when it comes to loading, memory size, uh, disk size, memory size, yeah, it's just more optimal. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and save it. And now let's go back to Castle Game Engine Editor. And as you can see, new files have appeared in our data directory. So we have mod monkey.blend and we have monkey.gltf. And when you click on it, 
you can instantly see that well Castle Game Engine has correctly read this file. You can also double click on the GLTF file to actually invoke view 3D scene, which is like a more full feature basically way to preview your three-dimensional model. But in case of this monkey, it's not really that necessary, okay? So let's place this monkey on a scene. Now, in the previous uh, demo of a two-dimensional game, I already shown you one way how you can add new scenes. So you can go add, new scene, and assign the scene URL. Well, there's actually a simpler way. You can just drag and drop the any suitable field format, like GLTF, on your scene, and watch what happens, okay? So the monkey has appeared on your scene. Uh, all right, so it works. We can create a new three-dimensional model. We can place it on the level. It, it looks amazing, okay, for the purpose of this demo. Let's duplicate it a few times because, okay, why not, okay? Let's also switch to the camera view to make sure that the monkeys are nicely visible when you start the game. Yeah, they are all nicely visible, okay? Okay, so we have designed a new three-dimensional model. As you can see, this was like a few clicks in Castle Game Engine and a few clicks in Blender, <laughs> so nothing special. Okay, so now let's do something more. Let's add a missile that you can shoot uh, from the player's position along the player direction. Okay, how to do this? Well, first of all, let's design a new missile model in Blender. Now, you have already seen how I'm extremely proficient in Blender. So I'm going to create a very, very simple, very, very simple missile model. I think this is going to be just fine. Okay, let's do this. Now what I want to do is I want to make it look a bit like an arrow, okay? So I'm extruding this, scaling it up. Oops. Extrude, scale, this is what I wanted. Now extrude again, like this, and Alt M to, sorry, M to merge at center, okay? This looks good enough like a missile. From the front, the missile points to us, which is actually exactly what we want, because this will make the missile direction correct when we shoot it. Uh, okay, what's more? Hmm, should we fix the shading? Let's fix the shading a bit. Okay, so like this. And yeah. yeah okay. Ah, uh, the tip doesn't have a good shading. Ah, uh, let's actually cheat a little bit. Let's do it like this, like this. Okay, that should be better. Okay, a simple enough missile. Let's actually make it a bit smaller, okay? So I want to scale it like this, okay? Uh, okay, enough playing. I want to see what happens if you try to shoot it, okay? So let's save it. Let's call it missile. Okay, let's export it to the GLTF file. Okay. Again, let's choose a separate because I guess I like the separate option more. Okay, hi, a small correction from the future. Before publishing this tutorial, I actually realized I made an important mistake when exporting this model from Blender to GLTF. You will actually be able to see the consequence of this mistake later. Where is it? Where when I was doing the exporting, I should have select in the options, I should have went go expanded the geometry, and I should have clicked on apply modifiers. Yes, you want to apply modifiers when exporting your model from Blender to GLTF. Because the modifiers you often contain some very much very useful stuff. And in particular, in case of this missile, well, I actually made like 
from your perspective. A minute ago I have set up an edge split modifier, which makes the normal vectors, which means that like lighting on your model, it works correctly. As you see here in Blender, the lighting works now nicely, it shines nicely on your missile. To make it also correct in Castle Game Engine and in GLTF, you have to export the model with the Apply Modifier selected. So yes, Apply Modifiers, because only then the Edge Split Modifier will be actually applied to your file. Without Apply Modifiers, the Edge Split Modifier is ignored and then the normal vectors look wrong and you will actually see in right after I finish this small insertion, you will see that actually the missile in our editor, it has the wrong shading, it looks a bit weird. And if I, if I would instead export it correctly, so with the export apply modifier selected, yes, then it would be okay. And uh, yeah, so select the apply modifiers. And it's kind of funny because I actually forgot my own advice. If you go to our website, castle-engine.io slash blender, we actually have a, like a good web page that describes to you how to export models correctly from Blender. And I actually wrote like exactly this advice. Yeah, I mean, it's present there from a long, long time. You should apply the geometry, apply modifiers checkbox. You should select this checkbox. Okay, no, right. and there we have it. So it's a simple missile model uh, done in GLTF. Okay, uh, now what we want to do? Well, I cannot really just add this model to the level. I mean, I can, but it it will not do anything do anything sensible, right? I mean, it's a missile. Sure enough, it looks like this when placed in a level. Well, but I don't want to, to place it in a level just like that. I want to spawn it. When you press some button, I want to spawn the missile at the player position and I want it flying along the player direction. Okay, so I don't really want that, so delete. Uh, let's now write some code to actually spawn this missile. Okay, so first of all, let's switch to the uh, let's switch to the Lazarus again and let's define what happens if you press, mm, for example, control button. Okay, just to be sure, let's fill add some lock to make sure that it actually happens. Okay, now what you want to do if you want to spawn a new object is you want to create a new Castle Scene instance and you want to add it to your viewport. Okay. So to do this, we will need an instance of the viewport available. Oh, it's already here. So main viewport is already available from code. Cool. So let's add a new variable called scene. Ah, let's actually call it missile scene. Okay, that's going to be better. Now let's create a new missile scene. Let's make it owned by the state and make it free by using as the owner of the component, I'm using something called free at stop. What it means is that the component will exist as long as the state, the state play will exist and then it will be freed when the state play will end. So this is, I guess, not, this is absolutely not an optimal way to manage your missiles because this means that the missile will actually exist as long as the state will exist. What you should do in an actual game is you should actually destroy the missile once it, well, collides with anything or just goes far, far away so that the user no longer cares about it, okay? But here in this case, each missile that we will shoot will just continue to exist for some time. Now we want to load the model of the missile. And to do this we use the load method of the scene and we simply pass the file name that we want to load. So this is missile.gltf and it's placed in the top level directory of our data. So we use a special castle data component and then we type the name of our file and that's it. We have a new scene containing our missile. Okay. What more? Well, we want to actually display it. And to actually display it, we want to add it to the viewport. So do it like this. Okay, cool. Uh, now, the missile, by default, will appear at the 000 position in the level with uh, 
well, with the default direction, so it will point, uh, I would have to look, but it, it will not point where we want it to point. So what we want to do is we want to copy the position and the direction of the missile from the position and the direction of our camera. Okay, so that's easy enough. We have viewport, the viewport has a property called camera, it points to the actual current camera that is used to, re that is used to render this viewport. So we can simply copy the translation, which is the, like the position, and the direction, which essentially is the rotation. We can copy translation and direction from the camera to our missile. Okay. And this should work nicely. Okay. And yeah, let's run it. Okay, now each time I press the control button, well, first of all, there's a log called shooting, and second of all, a new missile is spawned. Okay, so as you can see, the missile is not yet moving, it's also actually colliding with the player. So as soon as I spawn it, I'm actually can at one point I was actually standing on top of the missile. Okay, so well, that's not optimal essentially. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, we don't want the missile to collide, with the player at least, and second of all, well, we also may want the missile to be a bit smaller, but that's another thing. Okay, let's not make it smaller, it's, it's great the way it is, okay? But we don't want the missile to collide with the player, and of course, we want the missile to actually move along the player direction, okay? So those are the two things that we still need to do in the code. So. To make a missile not colliding with the player, well, it's easy enough. Just set the collides property to false, okay? And by the way, all the properties that I'm changing right now, like translation, direction, collides, well, I'm doing it. For, I'm doing them, changing them from code right now. But of course, they are also available in Castle Game Engine Editor, and you can also adjust them well on anything that you have placed here, yeah? so for example, scene soldier, well, it doesn't really have direction, it has, it has rotation, which expresses combined direction and up. It also has the property called translation, which is, well, yeah, position of the object that you want to modify. It also has the property called collides, that's on the old tab. And yeah, so you can adjust all the properties using code or using the editor, they are all the same properties because it's all the same Tecastle scene class, like scene soldier is Tecastle scene class, just like the missile that we have created is Tecastle scene class, okay? So it all like matches. Those are just the same properties of the same classes. Um, okay, so what's more? Now the missile will no longer collide with the player. Now we also want the missile to actually, well, move along the direction, along its own direction, actually. So the nice way to express some things, I mean, there are a few ways to do it. We could, for example, introduce here some manager of missiles that is moving the missile in each update method of the state, okay? But that's, that's not really like a clean way to express it. The nicer way to express it is to use something called behaviors. Behaviors are simple components that you can attach to a transform to like a tecastle scene, and they can, well, do something with the transform, actually anything that you want them to do, okay? So let's define a simple behavior, the missile move, okay? It's a new class that descends from tecastle behavior, and we want to override the, the update method, okay? And it looks like this. I'm using control space to let Lazarus kind of complete the method declaration for me. And now I'm going to use control shift C to let the Lazarus actually create an empty definition of the method for me. Okay, so it's very easy this way. And okay, so what do we want to do now? Well, the behavior has a property called parent. And this parent, in our case, we know, actually, we know it's a tecastle scene, but I forgot, I actually, we don't, we don't even need to know this, okay? The important thing is that this parent is an instance of tecastle transform. And tecastle transform has a translation and a direction and, and a rotation that you have so already, okay? So, 
this is a very simple behavior because what we want to do is we just want to modify the translation along the direction okay now we don't really know one, one last bit remains here is that we don't really know how often the update method will be executed I mean, in case of this simple game, we actually know it will be executed more or less 60 times per second. But you should never assume that there are a number of things, including when you render something heavy, that well, you, you cannot always have 60 frames per second and you never have stable 60 frames per second on all your devices. So what you should do to make the speed of the missile really reliable the same on every device when you should multiply everything that you're doing in this case your direction you should multiply it by a variable called seconds pass and this means that the missile will move with the speed of one unit per second um which i guess is a good thing for start okay and well, that's it let's compile and see whether it works Okay, so now I'm pressing control. Oops, now I'm pressing control. Mm, ah, the missile is not so the missile is not quite moving because we have forgot to do one thing. I mean we have this designed the behavior to move the missile, but we have not actually used it anywhere. Okay, so that's a simple mistake to fix. Uh, in general, I would want to assign to a variable, but in case of this simple code, I can just say add behavior, and I can just create the variable, the, the behavior like this. Okay, so this is simple. This will work. This is actually good enough for this demo, but just so just so you know how it usually looks like you usually actually want to assign it to some variable and then do this because this is just a more flexible way because if our behavior would have some extra options then now i would be able to adjust it okay so usually i would actually create an extra variable to keep it in this simple case i don't want to configure this behavior at all so let's do it like this and let's see whether it works. Oh, by the way, I can also run it using the F9 key from Lazarus. It's exactly equivalent to using the F9 key from the Caster Game Engine Editor. It runs the same game using the same code. In Lazarus, you have the additional comfort that you are using the debugger. So actually go ahead and compile it from Lazarus if you want. It's all the same, whether you do it from Lazarus or from Caster Game Engine Editor. Oh, yeah. So let's execute it this time from Lazarus. And now when I press Control, all right, it's the slowest possible moving missile. Okay, <laughs> obviously I could modify the speed like this. So now it's 10 units per second. Okay, cool. And now I can shoot missiles. And as I'm saying, right now those, as I, as I, as I, as I, as I warned you, like, right now those missiles, they just stay existing forever in your scene. They never disappear and they also never hit anything. <laughs> so that's not a very good way to kind of manage your missiles. Now what you should actually do in the real game is you should first of all check whether the missile collides with some uh, soldier. I will leave this like an exercise for you, but basically a hint. You can access, you can you can go ahead and figure it out in the behavior of your missile. For example, you can iterate over the bounding boxes of your soldiers. Okay, so you have here an array of soldiers that is actually created for you. Soldier scene. You can keep your soldiers as a inside an array somewhere, and for each soldier you can determine the bounding box at each step. Okay, so you have something like soldiers in bounding box, okay. And using this property, but not at the creation time, but somewhere here, you could write a code, like for example, 
for its soldier in the soldier server to do and here you would create a code that basically looks at the soldier bounding box and check whether it collides with the current missile bounding box and if yes then you want to do something okay the something can be anything you want for example you can place uh, you can play a die animation on your soldier like this or you can just make the soldier disappear like this okay so what i wrote here is a pseudocode i don't want to i want this to be a quick tutorial so i don't want to finish it let's be kind of an exercise for you if you'd like to play with it more and that's actually it thank you thank you very much for listening that's all i wanted to show in this simple castle game engine tutorial maybe not so simple and the end but i hope it was interesting and uh, yeah uh, thank you very much for trying out Castle Game Engine. Uh, if you if you want to, I encourage you to want to. So uh, please go ahead and visit our forum, our Discord, and kind of share your creations. Whatever you're doing, we want to see a screenshot of it. We want to see, we want to hear about it. And last but not least, well, please do support. Uh, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. This is what allows us to keep the engine. Well, Gong, we are already hiring one developer, Andrzej Kliański has brought like a new quality basically to the engine. We want to hire more people and have let them have more time to develop the engine. So we really count on your donations to Patreon to kind of keep the engine going. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I want to see your games and thank you. See ya.